Could this distant ocean be teeming with life? In the constellation of Leo, 124 light years away, scientists using the James Webb Space Telescope have found tantalizing hints, a strange chemical in the atmosphere of the planet that here on Earth are mainly made by living things. Is this our first glimpse of an alien biosphere? But hang on, wasn't this exactly the same thing that hit the headlines just a little over a year ago? Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Lou, and in this week's video, let's talk about the planet K218b and why it's hit the spotlight again as a potential alien world. Today, we know about 6,000 exoplanets. These are planets that are outside of our solar system, orbiting a star other than our own sun. Of these, about 1% are deemed potentially habitable, meaning that the planet resides within the Goldilocks zone of its host star. This is a region where it's not too close to the star as to be too hot or not too far as to be too cold. It's the perfect temperature for liquid water on the surface, which is a key ingredient for life as we know it. K218b is just one of those planets orbiting the red dwarf star K218, a name given because it was detected by NASA's Kepler telescope during its K2 mission in 2015. Remember, Kepler's primary mission was hampered when two of its four reaction wheels failed in May 2013. These wheels were crucial for maintaining the ultra-precise pointing needed for its original survey method. Instead of ending the mission early, the team cleverly repurposed the telescope into the K2 mission. So any detection before this is named Kepler, star number and planet letter, and after it would be named K2, star number, planet letter. So K218b is the first discovered planet orbiting the red dwarf star K218. Okay, so you're probably thinking that red dwarf stars like K218 are much cooler and dimmer than our own sun, right? So how can a planet orbiting one be potentially habitable? That's a really good question. The habitable zone isn't a fixed distance away. It's the region around a star where temperatures could allow liquid water to exist. It's essential for life as we know it. For a cool dim star like K218, this habitable zone is nestled much closer in than it is for our sun. And that's exactly where K218b orbits. It's so close that in fact it whips around the star in just 33 days. Imagine that, a whole year on K218b lasts just over a month there. This speedy orbit actually makes planets like K218b much easier for us to find using the primary method that discovered it, the transit method. This technique involves telescopes like Kepler staring intently at a star looking for tiny periodic dips in its brightness. And that slight dimming is the clue that a planet might be passing by or transiting between the star and Earth. Planets with short orbital periods like K218b's 33 days transit much more frequently, giving us many more chances to spot that dip within a reasonable observation time. And that's precisely how the Kepler Space Telescope during its repurposed K2 mission discovered K218b back in 2015. So K218b isn't a brand new discovery. We've known about this planet for about a decade, but it really jumped into the spotlight around 2019. And that's when the initial observations using the Hubble Space Telescope, analyzing that starlight filtering through its atmosphere during a transit, Hubble reported this first intriguing, though later debated, hints of water vapor. Now, it probably seems strange that our telescopes are generally not powerful enough to take direct pictures of distant exoplanets like K218b. If we only know that it's there because of that dip in the starlight during a transit, how can we possibly figure out what its atmosphere is made out of? Well, the answer lies in a clever technique called transmission spectroscopy. First, astronomers carefully measure the light from the host star K218b when the planet is not transiting. They then stretch this light out into its different wavelengths, like a rainbow, to get the star's baseline spectrum. 
This spectrum contains information about the star itself. It has dips and bumps, and these correspond to different absorption and emission of elements and molecules that are present in the star. Then they'll do the same thing whilst K218b is transiting in front of the star. During this transit, a tiny fraction of that starlight has to pass through the upper layers of K218b's atmosphere before it reaches our own telescopes. And as that starlight filters through the planet's atmosphere, specific atoms and molecules that are present in that planet's atmosphere will also be absorbed through very specific wavelengths of light. By comparing the spectrum measured during the transit to the baseline spectrum of the star alone, astronomers can pinpoint exactly at which wavelengths of light are different. This acts like a unique chemical footprint, revealing which gases are present in the planet's atmosphere. Now, with Hubble, they're only able to find water on this planet, and this is because HST can observe from approximately 0.2 to 1.7 micrometers, so visible wavelength edging into the near-infrared. It's a very narrow range, and while it's perfect for detecting water vapor, which has an absorption at 1.4 microns, there are also other things that can absorb in that wavelength too, so it's kind of ambiguous. The limited spectral resolution and sensitivity means that you couldn't see other molecular species like methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and ammonia. So it's with this exact same method that about a year ago, James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, made this massive discovery. JWST used its nearest and near-spec instruments to collect spectra across a much wider wavelength range, 0.9 to 5.2 microns. And with this better resolution and better signal to noise ratio. In their work, they get a good agreement with HST results except for two points, which means that that water vapor detection may more likely be due to methane, CH4, or a combination of methane and water instead of just water alone. The JWST results provided clear, strong detections of both methane and carbon dioxide, CO2, in K218b's atmosphere. But importantly, no ammonia, NH3. Now this is important because it suggests that the K218b is a candidate Haitian world. The word being a portmanteau of hydrogen and ocean, meaning it's a planet with liquid water oceans under a hydrogen atmosphere. Now, I just said that water vapor detection is probably incorrect, so why do we even think that this planet is covered in water? Well, remember, JWST is only detecting things in the planet's atmosphere and not on the surface. Ammonia is known to be highly soluble in water, so it would dissolve into the ocean rather than remaining abundant in the gaseous atmosphere above it. The abundance of methane and carbon dioxide combined with that lack of ammonia supports the idea that this planet is in fact Haitian. But that's not really the exciting part. The exciting part that they found was that they also detected a hint of dimethyl sulfide, DMS. Now, this is a highly intriguing thing because here on Earth, DMS is overwhelmingly produced by life, primarily phytoplankton and other marine microorganisms. DMS is a molecule that gives the sea its characteristic smell. But the detected abundance for DMS is highly dependent on how offsets between the different instruments, the nearest and near spec instruments, were handled in the analyses. The detection was 2.4 sigma at best in detection, which corresponds to roughly a 1 in 61 chance that this signal was just a random statistical fluke. So the scientific community just weren't convinced. Typically, a scientific discovery requires five sigma significance or above, which corresponds to a one in a million chance that the findings are due to random chance. But also, the authors only used one method to analyze this data. Building on those initial hints, the same team of scientists recently reported new findings from K218b, but this time they used a different tool on JWST, JWST's mid-infrared instrument, MIRI. Now, MIRI observes in even longer infrared wavelengths, roughly 6 to 12 micrometers, 
providing a completely independent view compared to the earlier near-infrared observations. This new MIRI data revealed independent evidence, strengthening the case for dimethyl sulfide DMS and also or dimethyl disulfide, DMDS, in K218b's atmosphere. Both of these molecules are significant because on Earth, they are primarily linked to biological activity, making them potential biosignatures. Whilst DMS is mainly produced by oceanic microbes, DMDS is widely produced by bacteria, fungi, plants, and animals. In fact, this molecule smells like garlic and it's often used in food additives, things like onion, garlic, cheese, and other meat flavorings. The detection significance in the latest observations for the presence of DMS and or DMDS is reported at about three sigma. But DMS and DMDS have very similar features in the MIRI range, making it difficult to definitively distinguish between them or precisely determine how much of each individual molecule is in that current data alone. Either way, it's still notably stronger than that very tentative hint reported in the previous 2023 study, which used different JWST instruments and only one analysis method. While marine life produces a large total amount of DMS globally here on Earth, the gas is reactive and it doesn't last very long in the atmosphere, so its concentration typically remains quite small. The concentration on K218b is, however, thousands of times higher than it is here on Earth. Does that mean that the planet is teeming with life? Also, these molecules break down quite quickly, which means that there must be strong and continuous supplies of it. Now, the new results are only three sigma, remember, so it's not that five sigma that we need it to be to be this massive discovery. It can't be considered definitive proof yet. More observations are still needed to increase that robustness of that finding, like an additional one to three three transits observed with MIRI, so about 8 to 24 hours of telescope time, potentially could be enough to push that significance level to the 4 to 5 sigma level. Beyond just confirming the signal's statistical strength, there's a huge question of even if DMS or DMDS are actually there, does it actually mean that there is life there? While these molecules are strongly linked to biological processes here on Earth, we have to be really careful assuming the same assumptions hold everywhere else. K218b is very different from our world. It's likely a hydrogen planet with a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, potentially different temperatures and pressures, and it's much heavier, about 8.6 times heavier than Earth, meaning significantly higher gravity. Unknown geological processes or chemical processes unique to such environments could potentially produce these gases abiotically. Scientists are actively exploring these false positive scenarios. For instance, DMS was actually detected on the comet 67P, and that study showed that DMS can also be formed through abiotic processes on the comet, so it's probably not a great indicator of extraterrestrial life. But either way, finding potential biosignatures like DMS, DMDS is just the first step. I'm sure it's not the only finding that we'll have now that JWST is operational, we'll have all the time in the world to collect more. Anyway, that's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe.